Shoop, shoop, diddy wop, come a come a wang dang. The New Zealand new wave track that became a worldwide hit from Monty Video and the cassettes. With me is the man behind Monty, Murray Grindley, one of New Zealand's music legends. Murray, thank you for coming on Revenge of the 80s Radio with us. It's a pleasure, Chris. Murray, you span the musical spectrum as a rocker, a new waver, comic composer, writer, and creator of popular ad jingles. We're going to talk about all of that, but let's start from the beginning. You were raised in Scotland, then moved to Auckland, New Zealand. That's right. Now, little did anyone know the course of music history might have been changed. You might have been a UK rocker. But what brought you and your family to New Zealand as a teen? Well, I came here when I was 13 years old, and, and it was because of my father. He, he, was, he was transferred here. He was uh, uh, an instrument engineer, and... Um, he had a choice. We we could have gone to South Africa, we could have gone to Brazil, or we could have gone to New Zealand. And they chose New Zealand, my parents, um, because it seemed uh, the most like home. And uh, and that's how that happened. Uh, Brazil could have been interesting. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm a Kiwi. Well, it must have been a long plane flight, I'll tell you that. Well, we sort of came, came through the East and spent a lot of time up in the East as well, you know, so it was fantastic for me, you know, like, uh, um, I mean, for, for a 13-year-old boy that who'd never really been out of Scotland to suddenly be in Bangkok and, and uh, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, so we spent quite a time, so, so it was sort of a leisurely trip, really. At least that eased up on the potential culture shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, like, New Zealand's a fabulous place. I don't know if you've ever been here, but it's, um, it's really fantastic. And, and uh, we moved to a place called, called St. Helia's in Auckland, which, which is a little beach village. And you, you, you can imagine my glee, you know, when I arrived here and the sun was shining and um, people were walking around with no shoes, which was one of the things that impressed me most at the time, you know. <laughs> You know, like people walk around their bare feet over here. It's fabulous. Well, New Zealand is one place I would really like to go to. <laughs> well, well, you'll have someone to visit if you do. Oh, that would be very nice. We'd love to do that. Maybe jam a little bit. <laughs> bring the dogs, you know? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> bring the dash ones. <laughs> I was hoping that your baseball team would make the World Baseball Classic. They came very close. Oh, really? I didn't even realize we had a baseball team, you know? <laughs> because over here, the big game is rugby. That's true. Of course, your uh, soccer team did rather well. The old whites. Yes, I'm aware of the soccer team. Yes, they're, 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 they're pretty sharp. Yeah, the all whites made a very good impression in the last World Cup. But Nice one. Yeah, what got you into music, though? Music, well, I, I sort of knew that I wanted to be a musician since about the age of nine or ten. Well, in fact, there's a story that my mum tells me. Um, I'd, I'd be in Scotland, I'd be standing on the coal bunker, you know, because in Scotland you had the coal bunker in, in uh, the back garden. And I'd be standing on, the, on uh, the coal bunker, apparently, yelling out to my Auntie Eileen, Auntie Eileen, Auntie Eileen, think of a stage name for me. You know, so, uh, you know, like I, 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 I always wanted to be a musician. Chris Cordani here with Murray Grindley on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Murray, we mentioned before you really went across the musical spectrum, and that got me curious to wonder who were your musical influences in the early years. Well, in the early years, um, well, when I was a boy, it was, it, it was people like the Everly Brothers, Roy Orbison, Elvis, um, Cliff, Cliff Richards. You know, I mean, he 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 was uh, he uh, was big in uh, Britain at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, like people like that. You know, just. Just, just love that stuff, and then a little bit later on, of course, when I got to about fifteen uh, or sixteen, I discovered the blues. People like, and I sort of discovered the blues through the English uh, connection, really. Like people like John Mayall, you know, who I was a big fan of, Eric Clapton, etc. And that sort of turned me on to the people that they were listening to, which was people like Muddy Waters. Howling Wolf would be my absolute favorite. The 60s in the U.S. and the U.K. were a very interesting musical scene. What was the music scene like in New Zealand back then? Uh, well, it was much the same as, as around the rest of the world, really. Um, just, just a much smaller place, you know. But uh, we uh, used to get all the latest records, you know. Like, it was much the same as what happened in Liverpool and places like that, you know, because Auckland's a port. So, of course, you would have the sailors coming in with, with all the new records. And, and that's basically how we heard people like Harlan Wolf and Muddy Waters and um, J.B. Lemoir and people like that, you know. 
Now, the name Murray Grindley is synonymous with the band The Underdogs, considered one of the great blues bands out of New Zealand. Yeah, well, I mean, like, we were kids, you know. Like, I mean, it was different from what was happening in England, because you look at John Mayle and Clapton and people like that, I mean, like, they were much older than us. I mean, four or five years older, which was a big thing when, you, when you're 16, you know. Um, so we were trying to emulate them. Uh, but but like we were incredibly young, you know. It takes a mature musician to uh, play the blues as effectively as the underdogs did, and <laughs> you did lead a reformation of the group. How did you guys kind of reach into yourselves to play that kind of music? Well, well I'm uh, I'm blown if I know. We, we we were just fans, you know, and uh, and we just loved it, and we were pretty well the only blues band in New Zealand, really. I think. Um, most of the others, oh, oh, there's a couple of great bands. There was a marvelous band called the Lardy Dars, but they were like a rhythm and blues band, whereas we were more just just a straight blues band. Uh, maybe you know, like it was twelve bar blues all night. You know, like most of the tunes lasted for about half an hour or so. You know, <laughs> well, musically maybe yes. You had a little bit of the early punk in you as well, uh, mainly in your choice of uh, what to do during appearances on television, your dress, fireman's jackets, dry ice, a lot of stuff like wow. that. Wow, how, how did you know about that, Chris? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, we used to, um, oh, we were shockers. We used to, uh, well, you know, like we used to have swastikas and you know, iron crosses, fireman's jackets and uh, and we were regulars on a on a pop program here called the uh, Come On Show, and the producer loved us because every time we appeared, the phones rang hot with complaints. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people people used to complain about us quite a lot. You know, especially old old chaps. You know, who'd sort of been in the war and uh, and saw these cheeky young buggers out there with you know like wearing all that stuff, but. Uh, I mean, but the same thing's happening in England, you know, except it was Eric Clapton and people like that that were doing it, who, of course, as I've said, were older than us, but they were wearing the iron crosses and the fireman's jackets as well. And, and I suppose that's who we were influenced by. I suppose if younger people do it, maybe the older generation doesn't love it so much. <laughs> no, no, but, uh, you, you know, like, it was a lot of fun, you know, like, we, uh, we uh, had a great time, you know. After the Underdogs, Murray, you joined a band called Cruise Lane, and you also work with a group called Brew. Um, yeah, uh, we, we uh, myself and the bass player, um, Mike Wilson, really good friend of mine, we, we joined Cruise Lane, and we played in a club in Auckland called The Embers, which was the best club Auckland's ever seen, probably. It was a fabulous club, um, completely music uh, orientated um uh, i mean the stage had uh, a grand piano uh, a hammond organ uh, i mean like a b3 you know and um i mean in those days well even now it, it would be very unusual to find that and so that was fantastic then i the brew yes i joined them actually i think i joined the brew before cruise lane actually um and we changed our name to the Australasian Blues Champions. Ridiculous name, but that, that's what we changed it to. And we rehearsed for a year and didn't do one gig. Not not one gig. No one would hire us. <laughs> but oh. it, 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 it was a good band. And the reason I joined it was that two of the guys in the band were a lot older than me. I mean, like 20 years older than me uh, at at least, and one of them was an American a chap called Bob Gillette, who um, is uh, still living here in Auckland. He lives on Waiheke Island, and Bob was a master musician, a master musician, and a lot of the knowledge that I have about music, I learned from Bob. Bob, Bob taught me an awful lot. Chris Cordani here. Straight ahead, we'll play more from Murray Grindley, talk about the Monte Video character and what Murray's doing today. Sitting in the Rain, an early classic from the underdogs with Murray Grindley, my guest on lead vocals. Murray, the new wave scene was a budding one in New Zealand. Much like your neighbors to the West, it gave opportunities for those musicians who wanted to play something a little bit different. The New Zealand new wave scene spawned the likes of Me Sex, The Politicians, Split Ends, Dave and the Dynamos. But you launched a rather interesting project in 1982 under the name Monte Video and the Cassettes. 
the Monte Video thing was it 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 was unusual how it happened. I I was writing the song at home one day, shoop shoop diddy wop come and come away down, and I was doing it in a sort of a New Orleans um, feel, you know, sort of like um. I'll just sing you a little bit. It was sort of like a shoop shoop diddly wop come a come a wing ding a shoop. You know, um, I mean, like a Doctor John or a Lee Dorsey sort of a feel. And and this really good friend of mine, Mark Ekman, came round and and he heard me playing and he said, "Shit, that's a that's that's a really catchy song, Muzz. But um, but look, you're doing it all wrong." And I said, "Well, how do you mean?" He said, "You should be doing it a bit more English. You know, like do it English." And do it like uh, like that Bill Wyman thing, uh, just Weez and Rockstar. And I thought, that, that's not a bad idea. And then he looked at me and he said, and by the way, I have a name for you, even. I said, oh, my God, what is it? He said, Monte Video and the cassette. So that's <laughs> like, I, went, I went, oh, okay. Um, so uh, so uh, we went off and recorded it. And, uh, and of course, I use an English accent, in it, you know, and like I'm not English, you know, like I'm Scottish, you know, but um, he, he was determined it should be English. And then what we did was we, we, we somehow managed to get signed by Michael uh, Gadinsky, who had Mushroom Records in those days. Now, they were based in Australia. So the record was released in Australia before it was re- uh, actually released in New Zealand. And 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 it was a hit in Australia. It um, it was number one in every state of Australia except Victoria. The the, the uh, Victorians didn't want a bone of us, but <laughs> <laughs> but but like it was number one everywhere else. And what what used to happen? I mean, like it was an absolute scam that we pulled. You know, like it was be- because the Australians assumed that we were an English act, and. Um, I used to sit at home, and 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 we'd set up interviews with with uh, Australian uh, radio stations, and we led them to believe that Monty Video, who of course was English, uh, was actually travelling out of England at the time, and he just happened to be in New Zealand this week, and uh, you could have an interview with him because he was coming to Australia soon to do concerts, which of course was absolute lies, you know, and. And and like Mark Mark Eggman, who I who I mentioned, who sort of came up with the whole thing, he used to write me uh, a page of 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 bull, really. I mean lies that I used to tell them. And I, I mean like we told them uh, uh, that Ringo Starr was on drums on the track. Yeah, how did you get you, you them know, to believe that? I mean, one. just <laughs> absolute nonsense, you know. And <laughs> it was really funny, you know. And 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 they swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And, and it wasn't till much later that they found out who I actually was, uh, and it was front page, well, in some funny little paper, it, 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 it was front page news, Monty Video exposed New, New Zealand jingle writer. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it was really funny. And uh, then it came back to New Zealand through Australia, and of course everyone here knew exactly who I was. So... Um, and then what else happened? Oh, yeah, we, we actually got signed by Geffen Records in America. And, and Tommy Matola wanted to manage us. You know? <laughs> it, was just, it was just getting out of hand. Um, and I got a call uh, from a good friend of mine uh, up in America, uh, expat, um, Barry Coburn, who, who used to manage uh, uh, Split Ends and uh, people like that. And Barry said, Murray, you won't believe it. I've just been to Geffen's office on Sunset Strip, and there's pictures of Monty all over the walls. People are walking around wearing little fake mustaches, just like Monty's, <laughs> and sm- smoking these pink cigarettes that we had made. <laughs> it was, but then, probably for the best, it it didn't go off in America, you know. Like it wasn't a big hit in America. Uh, my my excuse would be it was possibly a bit too English for them, but um, but but it was looking pretty funny for a while there. Well, well, maybe the bow ties weren't as readily available in the U.S. as they might have been somewhere else. Well, like, possibly, possibly, but but I mean, like it looked like it was all on there for a minute, but um, but then it just sort of petered out, you know. <laughs> 
The character was kind of neat. The slick back hair, the mustache, as you mentioned, the bow tie, the cool gray suit. Gotta love the cool suit. Yeah, and uh, of course, um, the, the other thing that we had in the clip, um, I mean, you, you, you must have noticed, you know, um, I mean, like they're all drag queens, you know. It, it, it was pretty risque. I, I mean, like we were looking for dwarfs as well, but we couldn't find any dwarfs, so, so we just settled for the drag queens. But um, Well, the drinks, the uh, everything else, it was, it, was a, it was a really funny video, and my favorite part of it was when you were singing with a cigarette in your mouth. Well, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. My God. Very Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> it was quirky. It was funny. But the rest of the album was actually very good, too. Thanks. <laughs> All Night Long was fast. It was, uh, uh, the harmonies were good from your backup singers. And, uh, yeah. and the, the balloon scratch was, uh, was pretty funny as well. But I also yeah. like the second track, Who's Calling? It, was, uh, it dealt with paranoia and, uh, and people calling yeah. in the middle of the night and annoyances. Who's, who's Calling was actually my favorite track. It, 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 it was the third single to go out, uh, and then it did absolutely nothing. <laughs> just just like the second single, which uh, was Sheba Shishashu. That's right. Don't tell your mommy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so funny. Actually, if, 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 if you ever see the clip to that, that's funny. It's a really funny clip there. I actually tried out for my high school jazz band by using yeah. the horn solo. Now, I play the valve trombone for the band, so I used ah. the horn solo from Who's Calling. Yes, which which we put through a ring modulator. That that's why it sounds so unusual, you know. Well, the the band teacher was going, Chris, what the heck is that? <laughs> I said it's that a horn really solo. Funny, I can't believe this was happening in America. That's fantastic. <laughs> Chris Cordani here. Montevideo. Murray Grindley is with me. That's right. Murray Grindley, the man behind Montevideo and the cassettes. Before we get to the movies and your new business, Murray. I did notice that uh -huh. you were part of a contest involving covers of Shoop Shoop Diddy Wop Kama Kama Wang Dang in 2002. A group called Spatial Verb did quite a good job. I saw the video. What yeah, was it? It, 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 it was great, I thought. And, and, it, and it was so funny because they even tried to do the video kind of the same as us. And, and <laughs> they sort of had a guy who, well, he didn't look like me, but he was doing his best to, you know. <laughs> he had the cool suit. And the transvestites yeah. were exquisite. <laughs> yeah, that was, was cool. Uh, you were a part of this project? No, I didn't know anything about it until I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what were your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, I loved it. I, I thought, God, yeah, I mean, fantastic. <laughs> it was really funny. Murray, in addition to rocker and hit maker, you've been a much sought after composer and jingle writer. You wrote music for movies, including Sleeping Dogs and Once Were Warriors. That and jingle writing have been more of your career than rock. Well, yes, you see, because uh, I, I, I sort of became a jingle writer in about 1972. Um, because, wow, you, you, you know, like I just got married and, and I would have been about 21, 22. And uh, I was just sitting there, and I thought, my God. I'm, I'm, I mean, like I was working in a pub at the time with, with uh, Cru Cruise Lane, actually, and earning a very meager amount of money. And I sort of sung a couple of jingles for other composers, and I just thought to myself, how hard can this be? And I thought, I've got to make some money out of music. I have to find a way to earn a good living out of music. So... I just sort of packed up my Mari kit bag that I had at the time with, with uh, some demos of my songs, and I went around all the advertising agencies, and, and it was a case, I think, of being in the right place at the right time, you know, because um, like over here, it was almost like we sort of invented the uh, medium, really, because all the jingles up until that point that you would have heard in New Zealand were all sort of hard sell, sort of what you'd expect from a jingle, you know. Um, and I went in with with the sort of outlook like, no, 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 we shouldn't do them like jingles. We should do them like songs. And um, and there they went for it. And um, and I'm still doing it today. That was a very innovative approach back in the 70s, and it's now the norm today. I guess you must yes. have started the trend. Well, over here I did, yeah. Let's put this into perspective, Murray. You're considered jingle royalty over there. <laughs> Fans can check out some of your recent work on your website. You've written thousands of ad tunes. In fact, 
Your jingles have been revered to the point where greats like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Taj Mahal worked alongside you. Well, well, that's right. It was a, it was, it was a great thrill to work with people like that. I've, I've, um, uh, well, I mean, like I met some of my heroes, you know, I mean, my goodness, you know, and actually had them in the studio. I mean, Ta- Taj Mahal has become a very close friend. Uh, I've, I've done about five, five jingles with Taj over the years. And, uh, he's, he, he's a fabulous man, fabulous character. And of course, Stevie Ray Vaughan, well, I mean, he was just something else. Um, he, he came over. It, it was for a Europa, which was a New Zealand petrol. And in those days, it wasn't uncommon for us to make four minute, uh, commercials. And, and, and they would be shown on TV with very little product in them. I mean, like uh, the, the uh, Europa one, well, you wouldn't have known it was about petrol until the very last shot where they actually showed the logo. And it, the, the uh, scan that I came up with was I called it Traveling On. And, boy, Steve, Stevie was a thrill, you know. I mean, uh, I mean unfortunately, it, it, it was just before he died, actually, you know, like he died probably about six months later in that bloody plane crash or helicopter, whatever it was. Um, but he, he was the loveliest man. I mean, like he came into the studio, I, I, I gotta tell you, I mean, like he came into the studio and I had six different amplifiers for him because I wasn't sure what he'd want. I mean, like, would he want a Fender? Would he want a Marshall or, or a uh, Boogie? And he came in and he looked at all these amps and in his real sort of laconic southern drawl, he said, well, Murray, what I usually do is hook them all up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 like, I called down the boffin from upstairs, and he came down, he hooked them all up, and then I watched Stevie. He went right along all of the amplifiers with his hand, and he just put every knob on every amplifier on full. A bass, treble, everything was on full, you know. And then he hit a note. And and then my uh, pal and I, uh, that I worked with a chap called Murray McNabb, we uh, honestly, it hurt. This note that he hit, it it was so loud, it was beyond loud. You know, it was, I mean, it really hurt. So, like, we ran out of the, st- the room screaming, going, jeez. <laughs> you know? and, um, and old Stevie was just standing there looking nonplussed right in front of the amps going, what? <laughs> what's wrong with these guys you know like it didn't worry him at all but god it was loud but then he he proceeded to play a fabulous guitar so oh god it was you know like it was amazing I'm, I mean that man was one hell of a guitar player so in effect you actually put together a music video and then maybe later on it just shows the product yeah yeah well that, that, that the, the chap that did the video was a chap called Jeff Dixon who it was a marvelous filmmaker, marvelous film director, and he he actually sort of put it together. And what we did was uh, myself and Midge Marsden are uh, both in it, you know, and uh, we we travelled uh, New Zealand for oh about two weeks uh, with with uh, Stevie Ray, and we just had a little convoy of cars and trucks, and uh, we used to just stop wherever Jeff thought we could do something, you know. And so, like, I had the pleasure of being with Steve Ray Vaughan for about two weeks, actually traveling New Zealand with him. And, oh, God, it was fantastic. You know, like, he had the, the, the only ride.